All right, we're back. This is part two. Part two, okay? We were talking about sectionalism. And sectionalism is a division of this country into three sections, the North, the South, and the West. North, South, and West. You know that President Washington warned about this in his farewell speech? Watch about this. The country is starting to have different interests, especially the North and the South. He said it could cause a war. I think he's right. I think it did cause a war. People in different sections think differently and they have different needs. So because of this, in Congress, there was three young members of Congress that would play very important roles in these sections of this country. Powerful roles. Henry Clay. He would represent the people of Kentucky. That means representing the people of the West. He was from Kentucky, so he figured, well, I'm just going to represent all the people that are in this Western movement here. Now, you know, that's a lot of people. Well, the Indians count? He wasn't representing them. No, he was representing the new settlers coming out. So there was more and more people coming out. Remember what I told you, Daniel Boone brought 20,000 people alone just into Kentucky. So we got people moving into Ohio. We got people in Indiana, Illinois. They're moving on. Yes, they are. Okay. The second person is John C. Calhoun. John C. Calhoun of South Carolina. There's a big monument to John C. Calhoun in South Carolina, right in the square there. He will represent the people of the South. People of the South. And Daniel Webster. Daniel Webster. He's from Massachusetts. He will represent the people of the North. Of the North. Now, these men all knew each other. It wasn't that they hated each other, but they have to represent the interest of that section. So you know they're going to disagree. When they want something for their section of the country compared to somebody else's section of the country, they're going to do whatever they can to get it. Yes, they will. So in 1818, in 1824, Congress again is passing protective tariffs. Now, didn't they do that back in 1816? Yes, they did. And they're going to do it again. They were a lot higher this time than in 1816. A lot higher. Some Americans protested. Well, why? Why would they protest that? Let me tell you why. And you need to really, really pay attention to this because this is something about something you're all going to want to know later on. Okay, so listen to what old Zeke's trying to tell you here. Southerners were especially, Southerners were especially upset about this, thinking that the tariff uh, protected northern industries at their own expense. Northern manufacturers at their expense. Why is it their expense? They're not paying for it, are they? Well, they are in a way, and it's this way. Prior to all these protective tariffs that are out there, which, you know, they can't be good, but not forever. Southerners have been able to buy what they needed from Britain a lot cheaper. And it was good stuff. Yes, it was. Okay, so the higher protective tariffs made them buy manufacturing goods from America. Well, what's wrong with that? Because here's what they did. Now listen here. Remember we said something was $35 from the Britons? It was $40 from the Americans? And when they raised up that price, made the Britons pay $45, American stuff was cheaper. Oh, they raised their prices. They raised their prices on us. So why is that? They might have went up to $42 or $43, not $45. Because they still wanted the jobs, but they charged everybody in America more money. They charged them more. They were kind of ripping them off a little bit. Yes, they were. They were ripping them off. And so the Southerners didn't have no manufacturing industry down south. Had to pay more money for cheaply made stuff. They felt that they were being taken. 
this is going to cause some bad feelings, folks. Some bad feelings from the North and the South. Exactly what President Washington talked about. Interest of the North and South are contentious. And it could cause bad feelings. It caused some bad feelings. And they felt that their tax money was paying for the northern industry. Well, that's not good. That's not good at all. No. What are they going to do about it? Right now, they're not doing anything but squawking. They're talking a lot of talk. Southerners are not going to forget this too easy. No, they're not. They're not going to forget this. And it's going to come around sooner or later. But this is what's going to happen. Westward expansion. That's all good. That's all good. It brought a lot of serious clashes between the sections of the country. Serious clashes or problems for the sections of this country. In that year, 1819, okay, 1819 now. The Missouri Territory asked Congress to be admitted as a state. Missouri wanted to become a state. It was called a territory then. Now it wants to be called a state. Well, you know what they got to do? You got to come up with a constitution. You got to have so many people, 59,000 people. Well, apparently they had the people. Most Missouri settlers, though, that had come there came from Kentucky and Tennessee, and they were slave owners. That's where slavery was allowed. Well, they believe, therefore, slavery ought to be allowed in Missouri, too. Now, you don't say Missouri unless you're a Yankee. If you're a Southerner, you're from there, you say Missouri. You say Missouri, not Missouri, Missouri. Can you say it that way? It all depends where you're from. James Talmadge Jr., James Talmadge Jr. now, of New York, added an amendment to the Missouri statehood and it proposed that Missouri gradually, very slowly, would abolish or stop slavery in order to be admitted to the Union. I don't know if they're going to want to do that because they feel it's their own right to choose what they want to do. The issue of slavery created bitter, bitter debates in Congress. The House passed the Talmadge bill, but the Senate blocked it. So it can't go no further. No, it can't. They can pass all the bills and all the laws they want to, but when it gets to the Senate, if they stop it, game over, folks. Game over, that's all. Now, slavery was not the only sectional issue raised by Missouri's statehood. Southerners also feared that they would lose power in Congress if they didn't get that state. And Northerners worried they'd get too much power. Well, aren't they all supposed to be working together? Doesn't matter if you're Federalists, Republicans, Democrats, Northerners, Southerners, Westerners. You're all supposed to be working together when you are in Congress. But they don't. Do they do it today? Do I have to tell you? They don't. They do not work together all the time. It's nice when they do because guess who it benefits? Americans. They're supposed to be there for us. They work for us, folks. We don't work for them. But a lot of times they just don't want to see eye to eye on things. In any case, Southerners feared they would lose power in the federal government. Northerners feared they would get too much power in the federal government. And in 1819, the North population was five, more than five million. Now listen to this here. The North population was more than five million people. And this gave the North 105 members in the House of Representatives. I'm just not talking just a state or two. I'm talking all the northern states, 105 representatives. The slave states in the South had about 4.5 million people giving them only 81 members in the House. 
There goes that math thing again, trying to figure things out. What I'm figuring is the North's got a lot more people in Congress than the South does. The Senate, representatives of slave states in the Senate, was balanced. There was 11 state, slave states and there was 11 free states. So in the Senate, it was balanced. Now, how many senators does each state get? Two. Each state gets two. That's it. All right. So we're looking at 22 states. It was balanced right now. If they let Missouri in, now it would be 12 to 11. More power in the Senate. That's where the power is right there. They can stop anything that comes through the House. The House can pass something and they could stop it. And that's what they were worried about. Because now the South would have the upper hand. All about slavery it wasn't just about slavery. It was just the way they handled things. Agrarian way of living. Okay? Agrarian way of living. They didn't want that. They wanted to have something that they could maybe put a factory out there or something. I don't know. There's lots of rivers that you can float things on. Missouri River, the Mississippi River ties it all together down to the Gulf of Mexico. So debates in Congress were heated. It's the boiling point. The people were angry, yelling at each other. Can't they just get along? They just can't get along. Tempers flare. I bet even in your own life, tempers flare. Do you ever get angry at somebody and start yelling and screaming? Why? It doesn't get you any farther. It really doesn't. It's the quiet ones. Sit back and watch. And they wait to see what happens. Then they can give their answer. That's what George Washington would do. Yes, he did. That's what George Washington did. Do. And also, Thomas Jefferson did the same thing. That's why they're two of my favorites. Thinkers they are. Not screamers. Fearing that there would be a split in this country. A split in the Union. Henry Clay, Speaker of the House, remember Henry Clay? He proposed something. And he would call it the Missouri Compromise. Understand this now. Missouri Compromise. Missouri Compromise. So, Missouri Compromise was this. I gotta get my I gotta get my pages in order here. Missouri Compromise was going to be about this land that we call Missouri. And it would be something real easy. Everybody would just understand it. So it's not it's not rocket science. No, it's real easy science. So listen here. Here's what he said. He proposed, Henry Clay, he proposed that Maine would come in as a free state and Missouri come in. As a slave state, guess what? 12 and 12. We got 12 and 12 there. Yes, we do. That would satisfy everybody, wouldn't it? If we just had 12 and 12, you think it would. Okay. So, Missouri wants to join the Union as a slave state. Maine comes in as a free state. We got 12 and 12. There was a little bit more to the story than just that. Yes, there was. It would settle the question of slavery <clears throat> for a long time. Now, this is 1820. 1820. Slavery would be prohibited. That means not allowed. North of the parallel line of 36 by 30. 36 by 30. Cut right through the center of this here country. Anything north of that line... It would not have slaves. You wouldn't need them anyway because you, it gets too cold. You can't grow that much all year round. But below that line, you can. So you got Louisiana, Alabama, eventually Texas, Oklahoma, all that territory down there. Those states can be made and they can still have slaves if they need them. Well, it seemed like it could be an idea. So it would have to be on that line. It would have to be on that parallel line whether you'd have slaves or not. 
or not. So, it's going to pass, folks. Yes, it's going to pass. Because as March 3rd, 1820, I know it's blowing out here, it's windy, so I'm just trying to keep everything from floating away from old Zeke because I don't run as fast as I used to, okay? On March 3rd, 1820, the House passes the Senate version of the bill. The House passes the Senate version, okay? The Senate had their own version of this thing. And President James Monroe signs it into law four days later. So on the 7th, it signed into law. The following month, former President Thomas Jefferson wrote to a friend about the Missouri question. He said this, like a fire bell in the night awakened and filled me with terror, he says. I considered it at once as the knell of the union. It is hushed indeed for the moment, but this is a reprieve only, not a final sentence. This isn't going to last, he said. It's not going to last. Yeah, it sounds good now, but eventually there's going to be other territories, and is it not going to last as states start to evolve? He was right. He was right. Because this is 1820, and just another 24 or 5 years, the whole thing would come crumbling down again. It would, but we're not there yet. We're not there. So, this did work for them. For right now it did work so let's move on because i want to finish this part up and then we're going to be going on to something else well sectional differences and not political parties are going to influence the next presidential candidates is it that time already now let's look washington adams jefferson madison Monroe, we've got five presidents already, and we're on him number six almost. Who's the sixth president going to be? Well, let's see who the candidates are, okay? First of all, you have John Quincy Adams, who is the son of President John Adams. He's going to represent the Northeast. Now, these are the election of 1824. He's getting most of his votes from the people in the Northeast. Factory, factory owners, manufacturing owners, workers. He was Monroe's Secretary of State. So he held a position already. He's a very, very smart man. And good thing he's got his mother's disposition and not his father's. People liked him. People did like him. So he's going to represent a lot of people from the Northeast. That's a big hunk of land right there. Big hunk of territory. In the South, is going to be a man named William Crawford. Now, William Crawford, he's from Georgia, and he is Monroe's Secretary of the Treasury. Secretary of Treasury, so he had a position too. Very good man. Very good man. Henry Clay. Now you know Henry Clay. He had been the Secretary or the Speaker of the House, I'm sorry. And he's going to get settlers from the old Southwest. All right. So from the, he's representing the West, just the West. But there's a newcomer. There's a newcomer. It's General Andrew Jackson. General Andrew Jackson. Well, he's in the West too, but he is way Southern West. Southern West. Now, Kent Clay claim some of them votes he could but Jackson is eventually going to get votes from the south west and the south maybe some from the north too because he is a war hero the war of 1812 remember the battle of New Orleans people like that general he is spunky he really is spunky and so here's what happens there's going to be a vote. Yes, there is. Not surprisingly, no candidate won the majority. Nobody won the majority in the election. As the Constitution provides, the House of Representatives decides the outcome. So Clay, with the fewest 
electoral votes was out of the running. Clay, out. Crawford, President Monroe's favorite, to tell you the truth. He had an illness, and it took him out of the race, folks. It took him out of the race. He could have been a contender. He could have been a contender. His illness took him out of the race. So the choice would be between Jackson and Adams, two different kinds of people. John Quincy Adams, very, very well educated, spoke many languages. Jackson didn't like school too much, never went to school very much. At graduate, no, he didn't. But he was a military man and he was a war hero. Wow. Well, Jackson had won the most had won both the most popular votes and the most electoral votes. No. Adams was the most popular and he won the most electoral votes. No. So as Speaker of the House, Clay was in a position to influence people. I remember this happened before with Alexander Hamilton between um, Aaron Burr and Thomas Jefferson. So with his position, not wanting to aid his rival, Jackson, in the West, he swayed the members to vote for Adams and said he would be a better candidate. He would be a better president than Jackson. And so here's the ballot. Adams easily won. Easily won. Jackson wasn't too happy about it. No, he wasn't. February 9th, 1825, the tally was this. 13 states for Adams, 7 for Jackson, and 4 still voted for Crawford, even though he was sick and not running. Even if they all went for Jackson, those four extra states, he still wouldn't have won because Adams had 13 of them. Now, when Adams named his cabinet, which every president's allowed to do, they're, they're allowed to name their cabinet, he can tell the last cabinet, thank you, goodbye, and bring a new people in. And he did. And he named Henry Clay as Secretary of State. Uh-oh, red flag going up, red flag going up. So he helps you to become president and all of a sudden, now he's Secretary of State. This is what Jackson is saying. This is what Jackson is saying. All of a sudden, you have a Secretary of State, somebody that helped you get in the presidency over me. He called it a corrupt bargaining. Now, they investigated. They found no corrupt bargaining. They did not. Maybe they didn't investigate enough. You never know. They These people in federal offices sometimes they don't investigate things very well it's happened before it's happened since that time where people have helped somebody get into presidency and before you know it they got a sweet position in government i'm not going to mention who it was you start looking some things up and you'll find out who it was it was not too far away not too far back now that air of good feeling it's over with. There's too much fighting amongst the people now. Kind of sounds like today in a way. So the era of good feeling is over. It is over. There no proof was ever found that Adams gave Clay that position because he helped him. Clay was a smart man. Adams was too. Maybe he just thought he was the best man for the job. I don't know. I don't know. But what's done is done now. Yes, it is. Remember this. Whatever goes around, comes around. Whatever goes around, comes around. You remember old Zeke said that? Whatever goes around, comes around. Sooner or later, Henry Clay is going to get a what for? Yes, he is. And guess who by? Andrew Jackson. Wow. Well, now, Andrew Jackson now aims to win the next election of 1832. 1832. His supporters emphasize 
their ties to the common people formed a new version of this Democratic Republican Party and soon just became known as Democrats. As Democrats. Today's Democrat Party can trace their lineage right back to Andrew Jackson. And this whole thing that went down between him and John Quincy Adams. Now, Adams and Clay would lead this political group called the National Republicans and eventually would be called just the Republicans. So now we see Democrats and Republicans. Over the years, things would change. Some people that thought they were Republicans looked more like Democrats. Some people that were more like Democrats looked like Republicans. It's a mess, folks. I just know one thing. I'm a constitutional American. That's what I am. I'm a constitutional American. Well, Zeke, don't you have to be Democrat or Republican? No, you don't. You don't. See, I don't like being labeled, but I will do this. I will follow this flag in battle. I will also be an American, a constitutional American. Now, the two parties were very different, just like they are today. And the National Republicans favored a very strong federal government, a strong federal government, which sometimes can be good, but a lot of times can be just too much. On the other hand, the Democrats supported states' rights, which that can be good too, but sometimes they can't run their own states. You look at what's happening today and some of the governors... They're little tyrants. If you get the wrong person in there, it's going to be bad news. So you got to have some federal intervening, intervening right there. Democrat Republicans came mostly from the South and the West. So listen to this. The Democrats now, mostly South and West, and they had the support of farmers and factory workers, which factories there were there, not very many, but there was a few. And the National Republicans had more from the Northeast. A lot of a lot of Northeastern support and those that were in the South that had some factories. The National Republicans and the Democrat Republic the National Republicans and Democrat Republicans, I should say, later became well organized political parties. Remember what President George Washington said, beware of political parties. Because why? Because they will destroy this country. Yes, they will. What I've seen over my years, they don't work together a lot as Americans, but for themselves. Now, I'm just giving you an opinion. This happened back in the 1820s, folks. 1820s. It's been almost 200 years of this. Has things changed? Only the faces have changed. Only the faces have changed. Now, do you think old Andrew Jackson? Do you think Andrew Jackson is going to give up on this? No. The election of 1832, he's going to run again. And against two, John Quincy Adams. What do you think is going to become of that? What do you think is going to happen there? So let's review just for a second. We have some new states coming into the Union. Missouri comes in as a slave state. And we have Maine coming in as a free state in 1820. Both of these states. The country is growing. People are still moving out west. People are still making their dreams come true, but that era of good feeling, things start changing a little bit. Yes, they have, because people are arguing back and forth now. But it can always get better, and it's going to get better. John Quincy Adams was not a bad president. He was a good president, according to all the facts that I've seen, and he was a good man. Yes, he was a good man. You know what his daddy told him? Listen to your wife, John Quincy. 
She'll give you good advice, just like my wife did, Abigail. Give you good advice. So what seems to be the problem? Politics. We're going to get new people in office. And things are going to change again. And every time somebody comes in, things change. Some things for the good, some things not for the good. But in any case, we got to look out for who? Number one right now. Number one right now, and I'm looking out for old Zeke. And I'm trying to let you know that you can be, right now, anything that you want to here in this country. Whatever you want to be, folks. You can be whatever you want to be, no matter what the age is. Don't think you're too old to go to college. Don't think you're too young to have dreams. Because you can do it. And there's lots of people that will stand behind you. All right, my time is up. And I'm going to tell you the same thing I tell you all the time. Tell somebody that you love what? That you love them today. Be kind today to somebody. And God bless America. Because we are on the move. Next time, we're going to talk about some more interesting facts. So you'll want to stay with me. Subscribe to the channel here. Subscribe. There's lots of fun things going on. Yes, there is. All right now. See you soon.